Welcome back to PVC Loud. I say hi here with me, um, Banky W. And you know, now we're we'll going into the the issues that matter. You yes, know. sir. Um, for starters, I, I, you know, I want to know what your opinion is on um, restructuring. Are you going to go to the house and fight for restructuring, or are you against it? So, my opinion is this: I think that when you first of all, when you say restructuring, you know, I think everybody that mentions that word means something different. Okay, so restructuring for me... No, no, hold on, hold on. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I think that I agree um, that we do need to restructure right. in the sense that our constitution is a flawed document, but it's not a final one. I think that there were some mistakes, and the idea is you have to have thinkers at the table to really pick it apart and say, what can we do better? What can we do differently? So, for instance, I think our security system needs to be restructured. I think international best practices have told us that it's wiser to have multi-level policing where in the state you have a state police force and then there, the, the more complex, uh, complicated investigations are handled at the federal level. So if you look at the United States, for instance, there's the NYPD and then there's the FBI. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that's the way that we should do it. The way we have it right now, we have a federal police force. And you may have somebody who is running a unit, a police unit, and he's from a completely different part of the country, doesn't know the intricacies or the nuances of that neighborhood. And we just keep going and going and going like that. I think we're not as effective in our security system. I think there are a lot of things that need to and can be restructured. But I think you have to start with the right people sitting in the National Assembly to be even to to be even able to have the debate about what can we do better as a nation, mm. what can we do differently, mm. as opposed to just doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Absolutely. Can I give you an yeah, yeah, yes, Can I give you another? Okay, so I'll give you another example. Um, most young people that I know would agree, and I don't know if you agree with this, but NYSC as a program doesn't really achieve what it was originally designed for. Mm. And so... My idea is, why do we just keep saying, oh, yeah, this is the way we do it, and we'll always do it this way, and not just say, can we do this thing a little bit different? So, in my opinion, excise it from the Constitution and make it an optional program as opposed to mandatory. Now, everybody who doesn't need NYSE, who already knows where they're going to work, what they're going to do out, out after, after university, will leave. Now, the people who remain, because there will be a lot of people who still need you know, a leg up after university, university education, then you can pay those people more. So instead of paying them 30K a month, which does nothing for the average young person, you can pay them 50 or 60 or 70K a month. And then the sunk cost of the, you know, the campsites, the buildings, the staff, instead of this just, oh, we're going to do a march pass at 4 a.m., which doesn't really, it doesn't do anything for them to, to prepare them for the world they're going into, turn it into a skill acquisition center, turn it into a chance for them to pick up technology skills, turn it, turn it into a tech hub, give them soft skills, give them leadership skills, give them something that makes them more uh, equipped for the world that they're about to face, either mm -hmm. as an entrepreneur or as somebody who can be employed by other countries. I think we have a golden opportunity to reform it as opposed to just redoing it the same way over and over again and we sink the same amount of money into it and it could be really ineffective and it's not achieving what we originally planned it for but we're Nigeria. What was the original plan? I think you have to ask the people who originally designed it. I think it was, you know, the idea was to have young people serve their country, right? Have young people be involved in educating, you know, teaching in schools and, and witnessing different parts of the country. I, I think it was actually sort of solidarize, sort of solidarity. But, 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 if, people, but if we're being know. honest with ourselves, does it still do that? I, mean, I think there are cases where it does, but I think most of the time it doesn't. A lot of people that I know, you know, find some way to sign, find somebody to pay, just kind of show up once in a while if they show up at all. And by and large, it's just not achieving what we originally designed it to do. So my mindset for going into office is this. The way that we get out of the mess that we're in as a nation is through innovation and reform. Mm. Innovation doesn't happen in government offices, typically. Innovation happens in the private sector. It happens at PVC Loud. It happens in banking or telecoms. Mm -hmm. It happens in entertainment. It happens in fintech. Uh, um, out of the seven uh, uh, unicorns in Africa, Nigeria has five. Mm -hmm. So that shows you that as far as innovation goes, we chase innovation pretty well. Where 
We're on that quest for innovation. We're already doing that. Reform, however, happens in government. Reform happens when you put thinkers at the table of policymaking that say, hey, can we do this thing a little bit different? Can we suggest different policies? Can we go about some of the things that we've always done in a slightly different way to make us more effective as a nation and more relevant to the global world that we're in today? Mm. The, the danger that we're facing is that we've ignored the chance to put pe people at the table of reform. And I'm not just talking about the presidency. Presidency is incredibly important. The governors are incredibly important. But we have senators. We have House of Representative members. We have state House of Assembly uh, members. We have local government chairmen. Oh. All of these people have a crucial role to play in the kind of country that we live. Absolutely. But if we ignore the chance to put right-thinking, like-minded people in those seats, then we ignore the chance for reform. And eventually, a policy can come along to kill your innovation in its tracks. And most small business owners know what I'm talking about. You, you are just trying to get your business to survive. You are hit by multiple taxation, these, clinical. I mean, you, you, were, you are struggling as a business person in mm, this environment mm, mm. because you don't even know who you're supposed to go to when you have an issue. You don't even know who to call. And the people who are occupying those seats, you're not their primary concern. We've allowed entitled rent seekers to fill in some of the most crucial seats in our nation. Mm. And they're not there to change anything. They're not there to reform anything. They're not there to think about anything different. They're just there to carve their piece of the pie and milk the system as much as they can. And mm. I think those are some of the ways that we're looking at. And bro, we spend more on payments and premiums and pensions to past leaders, past presidents, past governors, than the United K. They have almost 30 times our revenue. And we spend more paying... You know, past presidents and past governors, you know, you get a, every three years or every four years, you get new cars and you're this. I mean, it's, it's insane the way that we just keep going along, doing the same things and not thinking back to say, guys, we need to so reform. I, I guess right now, when you, get into, when you get into office, you, you give us a full detail of how much you earn, My, how much is awarded to you, I'm going how into, you spend everything. Listen, I'm going into office as a torchlight. I think that. I represent one of the very few chances where like minds in the country mm. will have somebody that they can actually hold accountable. Because most, let's face it, most of our political candidates, they, I don't have the background that most of our political candidates have. Most of our political candidates are imposed on the people. And people have Yeah, but that's what they say. Well, we had guys like Desmond Elliott has been in the Assembly for a while now. Right. And I'm not oh. here to speak on Desmond Elliott. No, no, I'm just saying but that he, doesn't have your, you. he has a similar background. He's not a right. politician but, per se. But in APC Lagos, right, we all know how people get into the candidacy at APC Lagos. You have to get the green light from the Oga at the top. With the guy at the top. So Ashiwaju, we know that. I, mean, I think every, everybody knows that. I'm not saying anything that is not known. In fact, my opponent in Etiosa, who's the incumbent representative, he didn't win his primaries in 2022. And this is a known fact. He lost his primaries. Which begs the question, how good of a job do you do that you lose your own primaries in your party? But he lost his primaries and he still ended up on the but ticket his, his, anyway. his opponent stepped down. Why? Do you think, do you think the opponent reason, just... Maybe also the opponent believed that he was a better candidate or If not. you believe that, I have a... a, 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 a <laughs> I have a fire in hell that I want to sell to you. Um, I think that, that he, he, not only did he lose his primaries in 2022, he lost his primaries in 2019 as okay, well. that's what I mean. We have a caller. Hello, good evening. Hello, good evening. Good evening. Please turn down the volume of your TV. Yeah, yes, please. You're on PVC Loud. Mr. Who, sorry? Okay, okay. I'm doing that now. So, my question is that, yeah? Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Danke, for thank you, W. Thank you, sir. I appreciate young men that want to venture into this our field as political as political okay. where old men are the ruling of all this why what's young men to come out but I want to ask you yes. what you, I want to ask you 
what what innovation do you intend to bring into a future? One, you know, it is that in their school. With the area boys, balls, uh, uh, green everywhere. Mm. And you are saying that these APC people have the joint area for it to destroy it. Mm -hmm. Lagos have been destroyed. Lagos have been, they have been really good with area and thoughts. Area boys and thoughts. Mm -hmm. So, what we intend to do? Or what do you uh, mean you intend to do? Concerning this uh, talk that have, have, uh, in fact, we have, I don't think there is any way in the, in the world that has kind of talk that, that. Thank okay, you. Very I, I think you said something to do with what we're going to do about the, the street boys and the thugs and, and the agbers and stuff yeah. on the street. I think. That's very so quickly. I think it's a, sorry? So just very quickly. Very quickly. Okay. Uh, I think it's a multifaceted problem. Mm -hmm. I think that when, man, how do I answer this quickly? When, when we don't have enough opportunity, then it, it, the likelihood greatly increases that people will lend themselves to various things, uh, to various, you know, undesirable things. So mm -hmm. I think the first challenge that we have is to say, how do we empower young people in our community to have more opportunities right off the bat. Because I think that most young people, if given a chance, will opt for something that they can use to fend for themselves and not live off of handouts. Young people don't mm. want to live off of handouts. They want to be empowered with the tools to pull themselves out of poverty. The challenge is that if you walk into any of our public schools, you will see that we are raising the next generation of thugs and criminals and armed robbers and terrorists because their education is not going to be worth the paper that is printed on. So private Nigeria and public Nigeria, people who are in public service, this entire two or these entire groups of people have to get on a consensus, an elite bargain that together we are going to put Nigeria on the path to growth and development. Mm. That means looking at our educational system and saying, okay, in a for instance, can we, I believe technology is an equalizer. I believe if you give young people access to technology and skills and training in technology, yeah. then you've given them a fighting chance to either become an entrepreneur or be able to be hired by somebody. Mm. My restaurant is called Suya Bistro. The guy who provided the tech backend for Suya Bistro, his name is David. He's a member of our community. He came from a less fortunate background. But years ago, he went and stood outside in Computer Village every day waiting for somebody to take him on as an apprentice. And he started learning how to fix phones and computers, mm -hmm. and then cyber security and website development and web app development. And every time he would learn a new skill, he would train his guys and his people around him. Today, he not only provides those services for me, he provides it or for my company. He also provides it for other, okay. I can't name them because they're not paying you people for ad time, but other really big international fast food chains he mm -hmm. provides technology services for. In fact, Earlier this year, his partner was in Silicon Valley pitching for work outside of the country where they would be able to earn Forex mm. by providing tech backend services. That's something that we can do. So in a nutshell, your, 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 your um, attitude towards that is to basically empower people. I think, I think that's part of it. I think that's part of it. We have to empower people. Take it off the I think you also have to look at the security, mm. right? I, as I'm talking to you, somebody, <laughs> somebody loaned us a car for the campaign. I live in Lekki Phase 1. Somebody oh. loaned us a car for the campaign. We had parked it outside on the streets to say, oh, you know, we'll get it branded. Go, went to sleep, woke up the next morning, the car had been vandalized. This is a car that does not even belong to us. Somebody was just like, oh, I love what you're doing. I believe in it. Here, you know, wrap my it car. Use it was it, did they steal anything they from stole, it? They stole the whole uh, radio, TV, the, the controls for the windows, like the whole <laughs> inside. They, they gutted the, the inside of the car and made off with it before morning. And so what that tells me is that we have a security issue, mm. not just like armed robbery, but even just like petty theft, where you can't even just park your car. And security should be localized anyway. So number one, it should be localized. But then there are low-hanging fruit, right? Why don't we have solar-powered street lights? Mm. And just make sure everywhere is lit up. That alone, it would shock you how much of a deterrent that your, is. Your opponent says he's done some, some street lights. Yeah, he but was why, here. We had him on the show. Well. That's great. But why did he wait until campaign season to do the street the, lights? To do the street lights. Okay. I think it's incredibly shallow and late 
for him to wait until three months, four months before the election, election day to be like, oh, look, I got a, I put up a street light in Itedo. Itedo has needed a street light for let's, the let's, last let's four years. Let's keep going on a short break. When we return, <laughs> I want you to tell me and tell the viewers what, what, what will you be doing differently from Didier Banikoro? Thank you.